only examples. It doesn't mean that if you go in a landfill cap, for example, uh, where it marks that you, it's important to know these properties. If now I would consider a GCL as my capping lining system, doesn't mean that you need tear strength because tear strength is typically something you need for a geomembrane. So the designer does have to look into these mechanical properties over here and have a closer look on what is relevant for the specific product he's selecting. Same with uniaxial, multiaxial elongation. Um, we have a two in here because it's a project dependent requirement. In a landfill with construction waste, I would uh, expect less settlement so that I wouldn't necessarily have a uh, multi-axial uh, elongation consideration. But once if I go in a landfill class uh, for domestic waste where I have organics in there, settlement could be an issue. Uh, again, if you compare it to a landfill baseliner, settlements in a landfill baseliner uh, shouldn't be there at all. So it's rarely required. Uh, typically, it should be non-relevant because you shouldn't have any down there. Uh, then we have the application of brazen resistance. This would be only the case in um, water storage ponds where you might have armor rock on top of it and the wave action could move your system back and forth. And depending on if this armor rock is directly on your barrier or not, uh, you would have abrasion. And then durability, uh, this is only a recommendation over here. It basically uh, considers the mechanisms of degradation of the geosynthetic barrier and the joints. We have to consider that as well. Often with geomembranes, we forget that the joints are also um, attacked by the chemicals and there's research going on at the moment on this topic. And insulation, I just uh, have marked in the list, or we have marked in the list a one because it's relevant for all applications. Then if you go into the principles of the designs in the next stage, there, these are some considerations you have to look on. Um, obviously insulation, the subgrade is important, the slope stability, you can't build too steep, uh, something I'm discussing in recent discussions very often that people look into the internal shear strength of a geosynthetic clay liner um, on a three to one slope, 18.6 degrees, um, and, and think that the bentonite, due to the fact that it's gel-like, uh, is the weakest one, but the interface could be much lower. So you have to always investigate on a slope all surfaces and not just uh, the one you think which is the weakest. And then climate conditions, temperatures play a very important role Again, in some countries you have low temperatures and other you have high temperatures, and this affects the installation and the covering process, process very well, uh, very much. Then the protection and the testing. If you have um, protection layers over a barrier, such as a geomembrane, you have to look at that. And uh, puncture protection is then a very important point. So there are a few things uh, to consider. And one part um, which I point out is very important Again, Australia does that very well. Uh, you have a high quality control or quality, quality assurance on site. Other countries don't have that at all. And if you miss that part, uh, that is the weak spot because then you don't really know are you getting what you're basically paying for. In the next stage after that, uh, once you have your landfill cap as it is, you have to now look at the suitability of your GBR on the raw material you selected. So Looking at a, a GBRP, uh, this is an ISO definition, that's why it's written in there. GBRP is basically what we understand as a typical geomembrane. It's a polymeric, that's what, why we have the P there. Um, a polymeric barrier like HDPE, LDPE, PVC, EPDM, uh, polypropylene, uh, those are typical, the materials we would see. Uh, and those are considered in, in this design. Uh, there you see that in a landfill cap, uh, you can see how it is considered in the group, in the ISO group on acceptance. So HDP, I think, is worldwide accepted. We know that. Uh, LDDPE is uh, general accepted. And then PVC in a landfill cap is rarely used. Again, this is not something which was done by myself and uh, somebody else. Uh, this is done by the entire group of ISO. So this was common sense that this was considered as the state of the art at the moment. If you look at a geosynthetic uh, clay liner or a GBRC, C standing for the clay, 
you can see in a landfill cap, it is uh, worldwide accepted. And in other applications, for example, in a landfill baseline, it's generally accepted, but not in all countries. As an example, in Germany, uh, geosynthetic clay liner is not used in a base lining system. So it's very much dependent on the regulations in the various countries on how the status is. So you do have to look uh, worldwide in your country in what status you are and whether you can use a GBRC or a geosynthetic clay liner for the specific application you have selected. Then we have multi-component uh, materials, um, materials which are manufactured of two different com components, such uh, as like a multi-component geosynthetic clay liner. Um, again, same story over there. And then you have the GBRB, which are the bituminous materials. Uh, they typically find their application in direct contact with water. Uh, once you have chemicals, uh, involved then it uh, moves to rarely used or general accepted or not recommended but those things are uh, topics you as a designer just have to check and get your data and use this guide as um, the first step into that so we understand that uh, all applications are different worldwide it's important that you select uh, your application and your best material um, for this application, but it is very important that you just don't always take a design from another country, copy it, cut and paste. Uh, you do have to look on the key uh, topics to see whether your selection is acceptable for your application uh, you have, and you have to basically look at your particular solution and your uh, lifetime as well. So looking at a landfill cap, this would be one design. Uh, again, you can replace this geosynthetic clay liner by a composite lining system like a GCL and a geo uh, membrane. Uh, typically, oh, okay, no, I have it in here, sorry. So I do have a composite lining system in here with a geo membrane and a geosynthetic clay liner. You can also use it with a single lining system, just a geomembrane on its own. However, the experience now is that more and more people are moving away to use a geomembrane as a standalone barrier uh, due to uh, welding and possible holes during installation. So people do typically you know, uh, use double line system and if they use a single line system, it's more and more going in the direction of a geosynthetic clay liner. Um, landfills, we typically don't really have to talk too much about because um, landfills are, in my opinion, worldwide, uh, one of the best designed um, applications because they know in the meantime that a landfill has chemicals and there's environmental damage if uh, something goes wrong. So we have pretty good um, setups uh, how to design landfills and most countries have plans and regulations for that. So I'm, I'm not gonna to concentrate too much on that. Uh, not very often you see in other applications that you look on local restrictions, that you uh, look at liner requirements, that you look at the leachate or the chemicals um, hitting your barrier system. Uh, the operation procedures are not consider considered. Other applications other than landfills don't necessarily have groundwater monitoring requirements. Uh, we don't have a closure or post-closure care requirement for most other applications. So you can already see on this application over here on a landfill that we do very much around it and do consider a landfill um, design as a barrier system and not just as a single one. So this landfills are pretty good covered in most countries, but for those countries who do not have these uh, regulations or requirements yet, I think this graphic gives you a very good or this um, it's not a graphic directly, but uh, these lines here give you a good indication what you have to consider uh, and not just build, take a hole, fill it and cover it. Uh, there's more around it, especially an important part, which is often forgotten that landfills uh, are really very, should be very durable and your financial assurance should be given that you're able to cover the costs uh, after closure. Then if you go into designing, regardless of uh, what you do, uh, you should always consider uh, an impact and the likelihood of something happening. Then you get a rating level out of that and out of that 
you then decide on how safe do you want to build your system. So as I mentioned in the landfill, uh, the location plays an important role. What distance do you have to the rivers? What's the weather? What's the ecology, uh, ecology uh, like around your landfill? So you, you have to consider is the impact then if my system fails very high, what's the likelihood that it happens? And you do your rating then. And then with that, you should go into the design and consider maybe a safer system than what you have been using in the past. Costs also play a very important role. I mean, uh, if you take the cost, you look at what material you have, how it's constructed, how do you have to maintain it? What do I have to know about my material to be able to design around that? And then you have actions, uh, often, uh, not often forgotten, but I, on my recent trip, um, I've been asked about earthquake uh, design with uh, barrier systems. And again, for com uh, countries, mostly of them in Europe, uh, we don't know much about earthquakes, or at least um, it's not a big topic in South America uh, and in parts of Asia, it's a very big one, or volcanoes around the area. So you have to consider that as well. And then you take action on that. So if you're, let's take the number one over here, if there's a high impact due to um, earthquakes and the likelihood is moderate, you are still in a very high uh, rating level and there's a risk that something could happen. And then your design looks totally different as if your earthquake, uh, if you have a very low impact of earthquakes and a very low likelihood of earthquakes and basically you don't have to do much in your design. So you do have to look a bit deeper into that and not just uh, specify a barrier system. Now, if you're unexperienced as a designer, which probably most of the speakers we have here, uh, listeners here, we are very experienced, but it's, as I said, this is uh, focused on the young generation, uh, then obviously uh, the, you sometimes try to look at the areas where you can get information. And in this case, the GRI GCL3 specification gives you a good guideline on a geosynthetic clay liner on parameters which you could uh, define in your specification. However, I always recommend to the people to look deeper into those and not just take these numbers and say, well, maybe a cap non-woven with more than 200 grams will give me a better puncture resistance testing or a better shear interface shear value, these are minimum values. It doesn't mean you have to use them. You are, as a designer, free to think further and consider maybe other properties. Uh, you can then take a more uh, conservative approach like done in Germany, where you have to fill in a catalog for a landfill capping system and you have up to 40 different parameters which you have to test and uh, approve. And uh, it, con it con covers uh, sealing performance, mechanical resistance, durability, intimate contact protection, producibility, performance, QC. And it's a process which sometimes takes years to get an approval for a regular landfill cap um, for domestic waste. So the process there is much more stringent and important. And if you look at uh, geomembranes as an example, there's even a more stricter process in Germany, uh, because we have a landfill law, the DEPV, um, which requests that the BAM, which is the federal agency for material testing, that they have a certification process. They write uh, guidelines uh, per product group, and they don't only do this for geomembranes, they do it for puncture protections, for filtration, and also for geogrids. Uh, the landfill uh, capping with uh, GCLs is covered in another group as strong as it's covered by an advisory board and at the end they always uh, do verification on it and one important part is they they also require a certification for the installers so again the same thing as we had uh, previous you put this in a specific rating level you look at the different um, specification specifications which are available you look at them and see, are they safe, good, average? Can they be improved? Is there a high risk? And then you improve your specification without making any statements over here. I just put the Lago one in Germany because it's very stringent as the safest of all of them. And the others are typically somewhere in the, in the area of good, but you can obviously always improve them. 
And, and there's a German one, which I, it's an old one from 1998, which we're working on right now to improve, uh, which I just would say there's a high risk, uh, there's immediate action required on that one. So landfill project, I don't have to go into the projects. I think uh, you're all aware of how geosynthetics are installed. And this picture shows very clearly that there's one thing you have to consider during installation. Uh, look at this bulldozer, he's driving, driving downhill. And downhill gives you higher forces, and higher forces means you have a different interface than if this guy would be driving uphill. If this is not considered in the design, and he's driving downhill, puts on his brakes, he has a high uh, acceleration rate, and your whole lighting system could slide down. Uh, these things have to be considered. They have to be monitored on site. I mean, that's the responsibility of QC people to see, are they installing the way it was designed? Let's move into another application, which I like to just show and show the difference between how things can improve over the years. Here are two applications. One is a groundwater um, application, uh, groundwater protection. Both of them cover groundwater protection. One is called the MTSE, the other one is called the RISTWAC. Um, and I'll explain the differences of both and show you how uh, this guideline has improved versus the other one, even though they do exactly the same thing. So if I look at the wrist uh, the first one, groundwater protection, basically that one covers everything what comes from the road, everything what goes off the road, which could go into drinking water zones or could go into um, rivers or canals which flow into drinking water zones, you have to protect those areas. And it's a lot of chemicals in there. I mean, cars, we know they have a lot of uh, hazardous uh, pollutants which can come away from the car. It's uh, the exhaust, exhaust fumes, it's separation of the surface of the vehicles, of the brake pads, drip loss, and at the end, obviously also accidents uh, when they happen that you have to protect in that area. So in Germany, we have these drinking water collection areas where you collect your drinking water. They are zone ones, and then you have protection areas around them. And depending on the groundwater flow, uh, they're obviously different in size and in shape. Um, nowadays, it's easy to find it uh, thanks to Google. Uh, there's a lot of maps out there and you can see, for example, this is an area where I live. Uh, this is a city over here and you can see there's a road going right down by and there are drinking zones one, two and three in this entire area. So once you come in to build a road into this area, you have to design a bit different than with a particular road. So the concept is basically everything what comes from the road, whether due to an accident or due to um, abrasive materials from the cars and could go into the groundwater has to be protected. So first of all, they look at the cover soil. Again, you see very clearly it's the system we're looking on. So you look at the cover soil, you have to investigate the permeability of the soils, the thickness layer, and based on the permeability and the thickness layer, you have a protection level, level of low, medium, or high. In the next stage, you obviously have to look at your zones. In this case, I only investigated zone three. Uh, let's not talk about A and B. This is just uh, a distance measurement. Uh, the next stage is you look at the uh, daily traffic. Uh, the more traffic, obviously, the level is different. And here you see, again, your cover soil um, or your soil material in the area, uh, which has been rated the slide before, it's low, medium or high. And then if you're in level one, you're basically safe. You don't have to do anything. Then your soil material is good enough to uh, protect your environment. Uh, if you come into level two or level three, you have to follow cross sections, which are in the guideline. And these cross sections, and these are only typical ones right now, um, they consider um, not only the barrier system, they also have uh, issues like uh, barriers, uh, car barriers and blocks for trucks on the side. So basically in some of these cross sections, you'll see barriers on the side and they should prevent trucks from running downhill or cars from running downhill, uh, crashing into um, the ditch on the side and then having a risk that material could flow over the side and go under the barrier. And then the barrier has to be designed according to section seven. And you could also collect your rainwater from the top of your road on top of your lining system. There's also another one where you collect it under your, water, uh, under your barrier system. 
But in that case, then if this manhole would be under your uh, barrier system, it had to be waterproof uh, designed as well. And then barrier according to section seven. So what does section seven really say? And this is the weak part of uh, this design guideline. That's where basically the design ISO guideline would help uh, the designer. It, if we just look at a geomembrane, all it says the geomembrane should be thickness two millimeter, have a sand protection or a geotextile protection on top of it, and the cover soil is 60 centimeters. The geosynthetic clay liner should only have a cover soil of 80 centimeters and only needs a long-term permeability. This is the only good thing uh, for this on a permittivity of one times 10 minus seven. So you have to look at um, a long-term permittivity value and not just a short one. Now compared to that, if I just look at the regular clay liner, and this is really a, a weak one, uh, it's only 40 centimeters of thickness. It only has to have a permittivity of 10 minus seven meters, a permeability of 10 minus seven meters per second. And the soil protection on top is only 40 centimeters. And this is just not a safe system. So more and more, uh, the, the uh, designers are going into using geosynthetics. Asphalt barriers are not used in this application. However, the design guide has, uh, even though it's from 1996, uh, says that you have to look at more. You have to look at the uh, effectiveness, the reliability, the economics, and other criteria. And you do have to look at these uh, criteria in here. So it already in 1996 is basically following the concept we have in the ISO guideline right now, that it says you do have to look at the influences from many other topics and not just on what's in the guideline. So people like to uh, take guidelines, just read the important parts for them, like section seven, and miss out the very important parts. And this is a, a requirement which is in the guideline, but doesn't give you very much um, information. So that's something where the designers uh, have to hop in. Um, here a cross section or here a design with a geosynthetic clay liner under an Autobahn in Germany where they use the geosynthetic clay liner as a barrier system and another project uh, similar where it was done under the railroad because the railroad, if run or an airport, if an airport runs through a groundwater protected area, this guideline has to be followed. Now let's move over to the other one, to the MTSE, which is getting more and more important. And I think it's gonna be becoming more and more important uh, throughout the world, is if you have soils with environmentally relevant contents, like if you excavate um, material, uh, in a construction site in Germany, it's a, reg a regulation that you have to investigate the chemical contents or the uh, environmentally relevant contents in that soils. So even if you have a house and you build a house and excavate your soil material for your um, uh, underground uh, basement, you have to investigate that soil before you can give it to somebody else. Now, typically that's not done. Uh, because you would consider your soil in your, on your property as clean. But the person who is, has that material is in future responsible for that. So if you give it to a contractor and he later on finds out that it's chemical relevant materials are in there, he has an issue because you cannot just use those materials. Um, the concept in, in the design here is that you take this material and use it as construction material because these materials if they don't meet a specific uh, value of contents, are too good construction material to put them in a landfill. So Germany is more and more moving away from the area using these materials for a landfill, for construction uh, waste landfills, and say we can use them otherwise because mostly even concrete uh, is good material which you can use for a road or for a dam. And the idea is now to prevent infiltration and permeation out of your dam core of out of these materials. The, this, I don't have the time to go in details in all of these factors, but if you're a bit experienced on landfills, you'll very quickly identify that these regulations here are stricter than in a landfill cap, even though it's not domestic waste. So just let's look at a few topics in this barrier system A. Uh, they differentiate between sensitive barriers, weather sensitive barriers, and weather insensitive barriers. Um, this is typical German wording. Uh, a weather sensitive barrier would be a clay uh, component. So a geosynthetic clay liner or a compacted clay liner. 
where the insensitive barrier would be a geomembrane because it's not affected by uh, temperature of the weather. I mean, it, shows, it gets wrinkles and waves, but that's not considered as uh, weather uh, sensitive. Weather sensitive is if the barrier performance changes uh, due to the weather, and that's typical with the clay. So if you look at this uh, compacted clay liner or geosynthetic uh, clay liner, it has a cover soil of one meter 50. Uh, landfills only have one meter. It has a permeability um, of a clay in 50 centimeters thickness of five times 10 minus nine meters per second. Fills typically only have one times 10 minus nine meters per second. And so you already can see on these two um, parameters that this is more critical concern than a landfill. Uh, what it does not have in system A is that there is a drainage layer over the, uh, geo, uh, over the geosynthetic barrier, uh, but it does define that the cover soil has to be a thousand times more permeable than your compacted clay liner. So basically, if I look at the compacted clay liner, the cover soil should have uh, less, uh, more than five times 10 minus uh, seven meters per second on permeability. So basically, they're using the cover soil as their drainage material. Now, if I move over to system B, also still relative sensitive, still one meter 50 cover soil. It doesn't have the parameter of cover soil being thousand times more permeable than the barrier because it has a, dren a geosynthetic drainage or an other uh, drainage material over it. So it's basically, this is a landfill cover, but still the one meter 50 cover soil in it. However, now the permeability is five times 10 minus nine because I'm taking the water through my drainage system away. Now, I don't think you have to be very uh, sharp to figure out that the designers are looking more into this system because of uh, the lower permeable, uh, either compacted clay liner or also for the geosynthetic clay liner. It runs through calculations, I won't go through that. It does cover the landfill uh, law. The landfill law is implemented in this law saying if you use a LAGA approved certified GCL, uh, you have an insured uh, design life of 100 years. Calculation, I won't run through that. Time-wise, I can't make that. Uh, but it is very specific on uh, reduction uh, parameters. So it does say uh, overlaps and penetrations have to be considered in your design. And also due to ionic exchange, the bentonite has to be tested. But again, they refer them uh, to the LAGA testing and say, if you have an approval from the LAGA, then you don't have to run this long-term perm testing. So you see, they already took some um, parameters which are not considered in other guidelines. They give you a minimum 10 kilonewton uh, strength on tensile strength of a geosynthetic clay liner. In this case, I'm concentrated a bit on the geosynthetic clay liner. Uh, they give you an uh, elongation of the material. They say you have to look at the internal shear strength. It must be proven. So if you don't have a LAGA uh, suitability assessment, you have to uh, go through those. It only covers pH values 5 to 11. If you're out of that range, you have to do uh, additional investigations. And if you can prove that you can design with one meter, if you have assessments for that, you can also just put one meter cover soil on top of your geosynthetic clay liner. Here's some applications, uh, noise barriers or road barriers where uh, uh, roads are built on top of it. You see um, the geosynthetic clay liner. You also see a geogrid involved. That's also in the guideline. They say, um, because if you might have caught that earlier, the maximum uh, inclination was uh, nearly 40 degrees and a geosynthetic clay liner would not be able to be built with 40 degrees, also not a geomembrane, um, due to the interface uh, friction values. So uh, geogrids are used. And obviously you want to build as steep as possible to get as much as um, uh, relevant material in your landfill system. Here another design which I just love because it was uh, um, done basically without having to pay the, this construction at all. It's a shooting range. Uh, the Olympic uh, training center of uh, the German team, uh, they train here. They had to build a noise barrier and a bullet um, barrier uh, due to neighbors. And uh, they, now you can imagine that a small club cannot afford to build a 23 a high meter a noise barrier. Uh, so what they did is they took 
uh, contaminated soils, which they got basically for free. And in some cases, they even got paid to take that material because we have so much of this uh, contaminated material. And if I say contaminated, it's not critical. It's just, as you mentioned, let's call it environmental relevant contents in the materials. And they got money uh, for taking that material. And with that money, they made the design and paid it. So with a little investment from the own club, they were able to build this um, Olympic Center shooting range of noise and bullet barrier. And here you can see how it was done. So they had their geo grid in there. They had a, a, a steel mesh in front, which was filled with soil material. The GCL was laid uh, over that barrier. And then here you can see the GCL uh, of the top layer, which would be the flap over. And the next GCL is laid over it. They fill the material, reinforce it, and you build up to 23 meters. And then method C is with the geosynthetic, um, geosynthetic barrier polymeric, uh, basically the geomembrane. Um, this one is also a bit weak because it only gives you a range of cover soil thickness. And I think we all agree uh, 10 centimeters cover soil over geomembrane is just not, just not enough. It very much depends on the planting and on the greening and what other uh, requirements you have there. Like if a car would run downhill, uh, here, if you would have one, 10 centimeters would definitely not be enough. So here is the designers and asked for to look into it. And the geomembrane uh, should have two millimeters. And again, I, I think it's quite obviously protection. Oops, sorry. Um, protection layer, uh, geomembrane, drainage layer, geogrid on top of it. Uh, yeah, the geosynthetic industry is happy about this guideline because it gives a lot of options uh, to design with geosynthetic clay liners. So the final topic I want to talk about coming to the end of the presentation is sustainability, carbon footprint, and community energy demand. This is something we're going to be working on. This is something IGS is working on in the various task groups. This is what the president and the vice president has on their agenda for the next four years is we have to look more into these topics. I don't think that's new to any one of you. Um, there's a lot of information out there already available. I think uh, I don't have to explain to you where we get all the carbon footprint from. Uh, production, uh, transportation, everything generates uh, these critical materials which go into the environment. So you can either stop flying around the world uh, and do nothing, or you can start um, looking on your systems when you design or build roads, how to prevent um, using too much CO2 or environmental um, uh, in impacting materials. Again, uh, it's, this is nothing new. We have environmental production declaration sheets. Um, at least I know they're used worldwide in Europe. I know they're used in the US as well. And it's quite easy to understand that if I look at a product group like um, a geosynthetic uh, barrier, that the raw material will give us the most impact in your consideration in your entire uh, life cycle uh, stages. So these materials are available. But again, what is this going to help you if you have this uh, and see a percentage in there, if you don't have the comparison to the compacted clay liner or to your asphalt barrier or to your other system? So if there's no comparison, data sheets like these are, I don't want to say useless, but they're not very valuable. So what we're doing more and more, and the EAGM, which is the European Association for Geotextile Manufacturers, they have some very nice, on uh, their website, if you want to look that up, uh, they have some very nice uh, life cycle uh, analyses. So we look at the entire life cycle and compare those with um, the systems we're talking about. So obviously I took a geosynthetic clay liner with a compacted clay liner, I ran a calculation on this. Um, the area was 36,000 square meters. Uh, the material thickness you can calculate, in this case it was 62.5 uh, centimeters used. You have your excavator, you have your distance of transportation, you have your compaction, so you can calculate your energy demand uh, your accumulated energy, energy demand and the CO2 in kilograms on the system. The next thing is you do it with the cover soil, but that's not going to matter in our calculation because for the geosynthetic clay liner, it is exactly the same number. Uh, so there's no reduction you can do there. However, as a designer, you might want to look at that and say, can I get the material from less kilometers away? 
And things like these should go into specifications in future. Uh, then I do the same calculation with the geosynthetic clay liner, the same 36,000 square meters, the kilogram of my geosynthetic clay liner, the bentonite included in there, uh, the construction, the construction <clears throat> so excuse me, the manufacturing of the polypropylene, the manufacturing of the, uh, um, it says your membrane, but it's your non-woven material, your geosynthetic uh, clay liner, your transportation to the site, and you do the same calculation. And now you compare those two with each other. And in this case, we calculated the uh, comparison of the energy demand in megajoule per square meter on the project of 36,000 square meters. And if you see the barrier with compacted clay liner, you see there was a use of 122.3 megajoule per square meters. And uh, I allowed myself to put a not happy smiley there because compared to the geosynthetic clay liner, uh, they only needed 70.8 megajoule um, per square meter. So we had 42 less energy demand. However, who cares about that at the moment? If it's not specified, if this does not go in some kind of cost calculation in your specification, and that's something what's going to come in future. Uh, it's, I might not uh, um, see that anymore, but uh, the new generation has to consider these things in future much stronger. And then we do a CO2 emission calculation on the same project, same size. And uh, here you have four kilograms per square meter with the GCL and 9.9 .9 kilograms with the um, compacted clay liner. And here we nearly have 60% less CO2 emission than with a compacted clay liner. Same thing again, it's a nice graphic, nice to have, but currently today, uh, the owner operator or purchasing department, they're not, they're not interested in that. They're gonna say, okay, uh, if the price is same, I'll use your material. And that's a, a lack at the moment we have where we definitely need improvement. So if I now come to the summary of the whole presentation, and I'm uh, quite good in the time, um, I think, the ISO guide 18229-3, which is not available yet, uh, but you can contact me at any time and I'll keep you informed if you want to know when it's out or you just stay on, on the website and check on those things. I think it's a good guide to show how to use barriers. It gives you a good guide um, what to do if you're designing with uh, barrier systems. I, I think uh, that's clear on that. It's not perfect. I, we understand that. But with the resources we had, with the people working on that, and all ISO countries voted on this, uh, we have a good guide which you can follow. Landfill regulations, uh, especially I learned that in Australia, you don't have to worry. You're pretty good covered with that. There's not much you have to learn or do extra. But I think there's still things you, you might consider out of this guide, and you can improve these guidelines. Um, if I look at the RISWAC and the MTSE, I would say is over here, uh, the MTSE for the um, environmental relevant um, materials, it's pretty good covered. Uh, RISWAC, if we redo that in the next years, we're definitely going to improve um, the geosynthetic barrier systems and specify them, or not specify them, but uh, write clearer about them what parameters should be specified. Um, Again, it's a good tool. There's knowledge in the guideline. There's, uh, uh, you have to read it at the end of the day. You have to look into it. You have to understand it. You have to look at the parameters. If you don't know, um, if, if you just, for example, take a GRI, GCL3, and just take those specification values and specify them, and don't know what they mean, then that's not the good approach. I think you have to understand each single topic, you have to understand, do I need a tensile strength for a geosynthetic clay liner? Is that important or not? Some people say it's important, but it's not important because downhill, um, you need it for insulation purposes, but not for the design, because if a geosynthetic clay liner on a slope uh, gets tensile strength, your, your, your interface values are wrong. Uh, the GCL should not take tensile force. So you have to understand all those properties, and that's what we have to teach the young generation uh, uh, that they understand those topics and not just go uh, are sent out and, and design something and just say, here, this is an old design, just cut and paste it and use it. Um, a future topic is energy demand and CO2. I mean, I'm not following this uh, whole uh, green line at the moment and following 
these these topics because they're modern and everybody's using them. The energy demand calculation you saw, uh, which I presented earlier, we did that already end of the 90s. So we already considered that. But that's that's uh, uh, 20 years ago nearly. And nothing much more happened since then. So these topics is where the regulators and where the designers have to put in more effort in future. Because, um, yeah, again, I won't go into the uh, environmental topic now, but I think we all know where it's going, heading to, and uh, the good designers have to look into that much, much stronger in future. Uh, the final statement I want to make is, yeah, the statements I made cannot be generalized. I mean, that's clear. What I did is just, I gave you an overview of the, what the ISO guideline is. I gave you an overview of um, our um, regulations and re guidelines in Germany. Uh, but you cannot just take them into your country because you have different considerations there. I think it has to be uh, application and country specific. And I think the designers, which are longer in business, they know that. Uh, the young people, we have to teach that to them. And I'm pretty sure you teach that to them. So that's it. That was the end of my pre presentation. Appreciate uh, you and I'll hand over to uh, Siamak. All right. Thanks a lot, Kent. That was a very, very interesting um, presentation. Um, I think we're doing okay with the time. Um, we, we probably don't have any time for questions. I received five or six questions during the uh, presentation, um, but I'll need to um, um, email them through to Kent and get answers from, from Kent. Um, maybe I can ask one. Uh, we had a question about this ISO part nine um, and whether it is available or not at the moment. Is it a draft version now available or is it a final version available, Kent? Well, it is. We have, uh, well, it is a draft version, but it's a draft final version. Uh, we had, it went out for voting. We got comments from all countries of all over the world. We considered them, we made those changes. Um, Pete Atchison from the UK and myself, uh, we worked on it. We sent it to ISO in the UK and they are now going to bring it into the publication process. I can't give you a timeline on that, but um, I expect it within the next weeks or months. Okay, perfect. Um, before we go to the uh, global synthetics presentation, um, I just want to thank you, Kent, again uh, for the presentation, for your time early in the morning in Germany. And um, we started with around, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we, just, we started with around um, 60 people, ended with more than 80. So uh, it's been a very interesting um, topic. Um, so uh, two Quick things. Firstly, uh, memberships. We encourage everyone to become ASICS members. So head, head to our website, uh, click on the membership tab, and then register your details. If you're a full-time student, you're eligible for a free membership. If you're a, a professional, you'll, uh, you'll pay uh, an annual fee, and uh, we, you become a member. You can um, access to all the benefits that I mentioned earlier in this presentation. Second one. The next webinar, so we're planning to do these things um, every two months. Uh, we have a couple of webinars already planned for the rest of this year. So um, keep an eye, we'll email you, uh, make sure you register your details in our website and then you receive the notifications for the next uh, webinars. Uh, so I go to Trico uh, from Global Synthetics. Uh, we have a very short presentation, Global Synthetics where our um, uh, sponsor for this webinar. Thanks again, um, and um, we listen to Trico. Thank you very much, Kent. Thank you, Samak, and thank you, the Australian chapter of the IGS, for inviting us to present. Um, it's with great pleasure that we present to you um, just a brief product range of what we um, do, which is just aesthetic clay liners. We share the same passion as Kent um, to the degree where we basically yeah, envisage that GCLs um, is a great future. It has many, many applications. Today, um, I'm just gonna discuss about the advancements in GCLs. So as you all know, um, 
GCLs have been around for many, many years, and um, they have a great track record. Um, a little bit about Global Synthetics, where Australian owned and operated, where um, the geosynthetics industry in Australia is probably about 35 to 40 years old, but with our combined staff, we have over 200 years, um, and I'm very, very glad to be part of that. And you know, our strengths come from our strategic partnerships with companies such as Nowa, Propex, Link, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We operate um, all across Australia and also the um, Pacific, um, having offices in Australia and New Zealand, PNG, Fiji, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As I mentioned today, we're just I'm just going to be discussing one certain product range, which is the next generation of GCLs, and it's basically the coated extruded GCLs, um, the Bentafix X range. Um, as you know, GCLs are available reinforced and unreinforced. Today, I'll be discussing the reinforced um, GCLs, and in particular, the multi-component GCLs. This is what Kent um, touched on. There are uh, different variations of multi-component, um, but we will be discussing the laminated. Oh, sorry, the, the coated, not the laminated. Benefix GCLs. Um, Kent went through this. I won't need to um, read it. We all know what they do. But what is so special about the new generation um, GCLs? As you know, this is your um, conventional standard GCLs which is um, basically bentonite sandwiched in between two or three layers of um, geotextiles. But this is the new multi-component GCLs. It's basically the same um, GCLs what you had in the past, but it's got an extra um, PE coating. This coating is not laminated, it's not glued, it's actually extruded in a molten state at the time of manufacture. So it becomes an integral part of the GCL and it operates um, integrally with the GCL. So it's not, um, it's delaminable and it's also unpeelable. Now we, we know what the cross section of a normal GCL looks like, but that's the, that's the primary difference. There is a coating extruded onto it. So like I said, in a molten state, so it's delaminable. And it comes in um, um, two type coatings. There's just the standard smooth coating and there's also a friction surface. Now, again, as Kent went before about interface friction, um, primarily on slopes, we, our products can cater for those um, um, interface friction values that you need to. So as mentioned, it is um, the uh, PE coating is um, extruded and coated as an integral part. Now the advantages of coated GCLs as against a standard GCL is that there's no transitivity um, between the GCL and the coating. So we're talking about gas and also liquids. And also a, um, a phenomena which has been discussed by um, Kerry Rowe recently, more about wrinkling due to um, thermal expansion and also um, the phenomenon of um, uh, downslope erosion of bentonite. Um, we have papers on that. If you need any more information, please feel free to contact us. Um, so the advantage of, of coated GCLs, like I said, resistance against desiccation, protection against iron exchange, reduction of root penetration. So in other words, there's no um, penetration past the um, PE coating. It's a gas barrier. It actually um, uh, permittivity uh, improvement up to a magnitude of about three, so which is a thousand times more water than a standard. And then um, what we just discussed about bentonite erosion. Um, this is probably the um, Bible that we adopt. Um, GRI GCL3. There is a section on. Um, extruded COVID GCLs. So um, there are standards, GCLs, um, classification, designation, but there's also um, 
this section here where it talks about um, extruded or uh, extruded coated GCLs. Um, if you if you wish to um, use any of our Ventafix products, we actually have guidelines specifications for all the products available. Um, just feel free to contact us. And as with this product and all the other products that we um, stock and carry and promote, we're supported by software, technical personnel and literature. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you again to the um, Australian chapter of the IGS. All right, uh, so this will be a, the end of our webinar for today. Uh, thanks again, Kent. Uh, I'm sure you've seen some of the questions that uh, was posted. Um, uh, uh, I think you can you can answer them on the Zoom and uh, the people who ask the questions will get the answers. Thanks to Carl for your presentation. Thanks to Global Synthetics for the sponsorship. And uh, thank you all attendees. Uh, we'll see you all in our next next webinar. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.